go to this part two of CG5042, uh, looking at reliability. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover the last part of the reliability section uh, with regard to image design. So we're on, uh, finished just on the slide before this, on slide 12. <clears throat> and we had spoken about the definitions for the different reliability terms. And we had an understanding of reliability, failure, the PDF, and the hazard rate. And we had this graphical interpretation as to what these mean. And we had discussed how the objective of reliability analysis is to get a prediction for this curve. Uh, so to fit some kind of a function of t, I'm into this. And then we can perform um, calculations based on that fit. And what is done is reliability software is used, and we use this uh, viable analysis to uh, arrive at uh, a fit data. So the next thing we want to cover is the bathtub curve of reliability. And this is quite a universal uh, bathtub curve. It also applies pretty much to, to people as well. Um, and it's called the bathtub curve because it takes on this uh, kind of shape of a section of a bath. And it's got three uh, distinct regions. We have region one, uh, region two, where it's pretty much uh, constant. And then we have region three, where the hazard rate is increasing. So what we're finding here is a function, is hazard rate as a function of time. And we've got area one is our early life. And this would be typically from, you know, anything from seconds to thousands of hours. So quite short duration in the lifespan of a, of a process plant. Uh, section two is the useful life, uh, which will go up to, you know, for a chemical process, it could be up to 30 years. And uh, section three then is the wear off phase. Okay, so these um, terminology is, is quite intuitive. So early life is where it's quite hazardous, and this is largely because there are inbuilt quality related issues. So there's something wrong with the design that is fundamental, um, and failure is precipitated quite quickly in the environment. Region two then is where the hazard rate is constant. And this is where the design is functioning as expected. And any failure that is occurring is as a result of freak loads or rare occurrences. And section three then is the end of life. So wear out is occurring, corrosion is taking place, um, the systems are reaching their natural end, and uh, the failure rate is increasing in the system. So it's much more hazardous. So section one is, is kind of termed the infant mortality, this is where there's a, you know, a fundamental flaw and it's largely related to the design. So really our, our objective in the design is to get this section uh, nailed down and really to get this point right. Um, so if you go back and if you release at this point here, uh, where you think that the design is pretty good and it's, it's meeting all things and you go to service, uh, you then see this uh, sudden increase. And very often, especially for the likes of a chemical plant, uh, that can kill it. That, uh, you know, you won't get any further. And uh, we've seen examples in, in the media of things like that. Uh, if we take, for example, the, the 737, um, there's an issue with the um, aircraft. And, you know, they released into service um, before it got to this point. And now that that um, you can see what, what the result of that is. So it's very important in the design context that you release at this point here, um, where you're confident that you, the design phase is complete. So really, this is um, what we're focused on in terms of design. Now, if you get that wrong and you release out here, your design phase is too long and you should be out in service. So again, you're, 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 you're not being efficient. The other thing that is important to get is to get this point. So to have a very good prediction of that, because in your economic analysis, uh, you'll be looking at the, this period here, because this is where you're making profit. 
and you're looking at your return on your investment. So you don't want uh, enhanced failure. And you may be interested in things that would extend and um, push this point back further into time. Okay, we'll see examples of that with um, with people, for example. You know, the traditional lifespan of a person would have been, you know, uh, 40 would have been old, and now that's pushed up to 80 or so. So there's a substantial increase in the useful life of people. And in fact, if you look at the media, what they're looking at doing is they're looking at increasing the retirement age because they're recognizing that when people retire at 66, 65 years of age, that they're still quite useful. Um, so there's no point having them retire. So push back the retirement age where they're in their wear out phase. Okay, so our two real objectives are first of all, in our design to get this point right, and also in our design to be able to predict uh, that point. So again, good design will tell us that we're released here. Bad design would have some flaws that will um, potentially cause damage to the, the brand or you know, just cause economic cost will uh, destroy the, the design. Um, this point here, uh, we need to get through some kind of a prediction. So getting data that can extend uh, into the future. So a typical way of doing that is to use uh, accelerated testing. So this term highlighted here. And usually what we do in class to get a sense of this is what you do with accelerated testing is you test a component to failure in an accelerated manner. So uh, what typical thing we do in class is that you know, we take in a box of paper clips and we'll divide those out into the, um, the students. So typically, you know, we've got 30 odd students. So each student starts testing uh, the paper clips to failure to see at what stage do they fail. And we do um, a distribution based on that. So over the years, we've gotten quite a lot of data, and um, the failure ranges from one cycle up to 10 to 15 cycles. But typically, it's around five to six uh, cycles uh, at which stage the paper clip fails. And it fails catastrophically in terms of their, their, it actually physically breaks. Now, we analyzed that a bit and discussed it in terms of you know, the force that has been applied has been applied by students. There are different levels of fitnesses. Um, there's gender aspects. There's kind of a, a macho thing going into with the guys. Uh, the girls tend to be a bit more gentle with it. Uh, but overall, we, we kind of get a, an average value of failure for the paperclip. Right, so typically we would have, say, um, say 10, uh, mean time to failure, where we are average for the paperclip. And if you step back and look at that, uh, we just ask ourselves, okay, well, how does that correlate to experience? So have you ever come across a paperclip that has failed in service? And I've been working for quite a while, um, 20 years plus, and uh, I've never seen a paperclip fail in service. Yet, according to this, um, after five to 10 goes, we would expect to see a substantial number of failures from paper clips. So obviously there's something wrong with our data. And what is wrong is that if we take a plot of how a paper clip fails and how it operates in service. So when the students are doing a test, um, take it to be some kind of a steel, or a typical metal, uh, with a stress strain curve, like so. And in this region here, this will be our elastic region. And, uh, I won't write. I start to write it by hand. Oh, it does. Sorry, one sec. And up here, then we have our okay. so in service, 
the paper clips are operating in an elastic region. They see a small deformation, they see a small load, they elastically deform, and they return to that original position. Whereas when the testing has been done in class, what students are doing is they're deforming the, um, the paper clips elastically, or sorry, plastically, I should say. So we open this region. And the failure that we're seeing is not representative of what is seen in service. And this is an important point for accelerated testing because the failure that you wish to accelerate and initiate must be the same failure that you see in service with the piece of equipment. So the paperclip test we do is valid if you're deforming paperclips plastically and that you see a plastic failure. But you don't see that kind of failure in service. They see elastic loads. So they're never in the plastic region. And we know that from the data that you know we will put our stated conditions on this that do not deform it beyond a certain strain so that you just avoid the plastic region in terms of operation. So you're not giving any warranty on the paper clip that is uh, operated with um, plastic strains. Okay, so that's the key point with this um, obtaining this thing point here with accelerated tests that the accelerated test must precipitate the failure that you expect to see uh, in, in the environment. Okay, so that's uh, quite an important point on that. And that's quite challenging, and there's a, there's a whole field of research and work involved in trying to um, come up with reliable predictions uh, for what that point is. And if again, if you can extend it, if you look at your economic analysis on your uh, design project, for example, uh, if you can extend this point, you get a lot more value out of it. So there's an economic advantage to that. The next thing we want to cover then is looking at load strength behavior. And uh, this harkens back to the previous slide that we just looked at with the paper clips. And uh, if we just swap over to that. And we know that failure will occur up here in this region for most materials. Okay, and there's we know there's different types of materials, um, ceramic, etc. Uh, ductile, and we won't go into that. We'll just take this as, as a generic stress strain curve. Uh, so we expect failure here. This is the maximum load that this um, piece of material can take. And obviously, you don't want to be anywhere near that. You want to be well down. And uh, typically, you want to be down here. So this would be the strength of the material, and this would be the design load. So it's a question of trying to decide uh, well, how much margin do I give? Okay, so you want good distance between the load and the strength. And again, bear in mind that there's always distributions associated with these. Okay, so you will not have a high level of consistency between the materials and the manufacturing process for the different units or, that you're putting in. So we'll have distribution associated with the load and also with the strength. Okay, and essentially, what we want to do is to avoid overlap, because if we get overlap, there's the possibility of failure occurring. Okay, so if we get any interference region here, this is where we expect uh, failure to occur. And obviously, if the two of them overlap, uh, you expect a high level of failure. So we give ourselves a bit of distance, and there's two parameters that are used, safety factor and safety margin. So we have the definitions of them there. And uh, if we take the safety margin here, for example, we see that as it is increased, uh, the reliability increases, approaches one. Okay, but this comes at a cost uh, because you have a lot of material present that is by and large redundant. It is essentially dealing with uh, quite freak loads, quite rare loads that, um, you know, down this end of it. So, Typical question is, well, you know, what value of safety margin do I require? And it depends on the on the scenario. So typically for, you know, um, most engineering structures, five is fine. Um, in aircraft, for example, it's around 1.4, 1.5. Okay, where weight is uh, quite important. For pipelines and things like that, pressure vessels, you would always be designing those according to a pressure vessel directive. So the safety margin is standardized, the safety factors are standardized. So that is built in to the design process.
So to get understand uh, low strength behavior in the context of the bat top curve. So at stage, if we go back to the slide, yeah, just here, the cartoon of that. So if we look at page one, what we're looking at is that there is a weak uh, subpopulation. So our system um, has flaws inside it, and this weak subpopulation is what's causing failure. So these are the, the design flaws. When we go to stage two, where the hazard rate is constant, this is our freak loads. Now this is typically, you know, if you think in terms of people, it's your, your kind of car crashes, struck by lightning, um, earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, COVID-19 epidemics, you know, th those kind of things, the freak stuff that we don't really expect. So again, our environment, our load has this uh, unusual distribution that uh, freak occurrences, and we get failure due to that. And as we approach stage three, what we have are wear of failures. So we got a degradation of strength over time. So our strength curve is not stationary. It starts to move towards the load, and then we start to see overlap and failure starts to occur. Now, I've covered quite a lot of topics in this. So what I suggest is that you go back over this stuff, take stock of it. Uh, you need to be able to understand the different uh, definitions of reliability. You need to understand this uh, bathtub curve and how the load strength behavior links back to that bathtub curve. The whole objective of this was really to give you just a flavor of uh, reliability and how it is linked to the design process. Um, as I said, reliability itself is a massive area. You can do a full master's uh, specializing in it. And all we're doing here is we're just covering you know, two or three lectures on it uh, to give you a flavor and introduction to it so you can understand the impact of reliability in your design process. Okay, the next section we're going to look at is corrosion because it follows nicely into how uh, we start to deteriorate over time and our system becomes uh, weaker. So this slide here, so corrosion starts to eat away at our material and it shifts its sources. So corrosion will be the next topic that we'll look at. And you'll find out that the stuff will start to get a bit more quantitative and um, away from kind of the wishy-washy stuff that we, more descriptive stuff that we've been covering so far. Okay, thank you for listening and uh, see you again soon. Bye-bye.